Okay, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the uh, the last panel. Yay! Um, thank you guys for being here, and uh, I appreciate your forbearance. As we get further on, we get progressively more candid. Um, so I encourage the panel members to follow your hearts, say what you think, um, and uh, let's talk about analogs. Uh, I want to start by just noting that the term analog is, is pretty broad when we apply it to spaceflight. It can mean a lot of things, and uh, we'll discuss a lot of what those various points are. Uh, but I want to start uh, by talking about when we first uh, returned to long-duration flight in the 90s during the Phase 1 program, the Shuttle Mirror program, or the Mirror Shuttle program, as you call it. It was uh, overall very successful. It's um, when I was cutting my teeth as a, a very junior flight surgeon and uh, starting to work with our Russian counterparts, and we got a lot of science out of that. But one of the, the stark realizations for NASA, I would say, is that, you know, very honestly, we were not ready for long-duration flight. Uh, our crew members were pretty much tooled for short-duration shuttle flights, and I will spare you the details, uh, but, but we definitely had some problems. And looking back on it, I cannot imagine going directly to the International Space Station program without that shuttle mirror experience. And once again, as is often the case, our Russian counterparts were way ahead of us in uh, preparing crew members for that experience. Now, fast forward to now, uh, I would say that uh, we have largely remediated a lot of those problems, uh, and a lot of that has been selecting and training what we like to call expeditionary behaviors. And a huge part of that <clears throat> excuse me, has included analog training events. And I, I think it's uh, arguably true that the, the character of the astronaut office is, is very different now than it was 20 years ago uh, when we were still flying the Shuttle Mir program. And, and we've worked hard at that, and we've tried to document things. And I think uh, one of the best uh, outcomes of all of this is that we have a kind of an international understanding of how we train crews, and most of our analogs uh, for, for training events, anyway, are indeed international. Now, the, the analogs we'll talk about today vary quite a bit in the degree that they, they emulate actual spaceflight conditions. Um, but I think all have the common factors that they progressively stress individuals and teams uh, so that their comfort zones are violated. And in the end, we want their comfort zones expanded. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Dinges had to, to take a plane and, and go off, but um, he's had a lot of experience in analogs, and in particular, uh, probably the most stressful analog study you could have is going to be um, run by Dr. Dinges. So think about that. He comes to you with an informed consent uh, for that. But we, we do backpacking, cold weather training, sea kayaking, a lot of these with the National Outdoor Leadership School okay, in ahead. the U.S. So you have teams that, uh, first of all, keep you alive in the wilderness, but also okay. uh, help you with leadership uh, disciplines. And then crew activities, uh, where we've either selected a crew or we have people who are crew eligible or flight eligible, such as the uh, Caves and Nemo experiences, some of those you'll, you'll hear about today. Uh, other opportunities we do that are more for the individual, uh, like the ANSMET program, the uh, meteorite program in Antarctica. We have actually, actually two veterans here today, Dr. Don Pettit, which is why he's on the panel, uh, and uh, Dr. Serena Onion, who's somewhere around here. There she is. Uh, who've both done that, actually served as uh, team members in international field teams uh, and um, just kind of blended in to non-astronaut population, per se, and found out the advantages and disadvantages of, of both of those. Um, but again, uh, I can really confidently say that these have positively influenced how we select, how we train, and uh, the crews that we, we send in orbit. Now, just from a standpoint of, of cadence, um, it's a fairly brisk cadence. We just put an international cadre through uh, caves in Slovenia um, just this last September. Five nations represented there. Uh, we did the NEMO 23 mission uh, led by ESA astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti uh, this last summer. And a little bit peripheral, more related to research, but we just uh, cracked the 20th uh, HERA crew, the Human Exploration Research Analog, uh, at the Johnson Space Center. It was a 20, 20th crew already. That was a 45-day isolation study. <clears throat> and they just came out uh, September 30th. Now, another point of analogs is I'm uh, focusing on training here, but we have multiple outputs. So that's research, hardware development, operational experience, and um, we can kind of split the, the analogs keenly into these main channels. So uh, the, those ops products have been really important to us because it gives us a chance to vet things before we actually fly them. And that's been a really um, positive thing for us as well. But uh, we'd also like to develop an additional thread, and that came from last year's discussion excuse me, on analogs, and uh, it was a very strong recommendation to train flight surgeons and, in general, mission control and support people using analogs deliberately for that. 
So uh, we want to talk about that a little bit as well. And I would almost say throw some mission managers into those mixes too and help expand their comfort zones a bit. And I think that would help. Um, and I would say also that we can focus the discussion on analog a little bit more sharply towards our new mandate, which is returning to the lunar surface uh, in, a, in a fairly short term. So short term and long term stays on the lunar surface will be a big different uh, paradigm for us. So fortunately, our panel covers a lot of ground as well. Uh, including a lot of experience in some of these uh, venues, as well as researching and managing the research from it. So I will start with Dr. Cromwell, but before I do that, I, I forgot to mention that this was found by Dr. Charles. Um, I believe he uh, removed the cash from it and left the book, but if anybody lost that or left it, it's a very nice pen and really nice notes, which none of us read. So I'll put it right here. Does that look familiar to anybody? All right, Dr. Renita Cromwell, we'll start with you. And uh, just quick introduction, to, uh, if you could introduce yourself quickly and then Great. let's do Thank you. Um, as Mike said, my name's Ronnie Cromwell, and I am um, an associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine, but my duties are at NASA Johnson Space Center, where I currently serve as the lead scientist for crew health and safety. Um, so you probably heard a few comments from me yesterday, if you were here, about the TREAT Act um, when we did the Longitudinal Studies Board. However, before that, um, I spent time in the human research program in a number of capacities working with analogs. So. Um, with that hat on, so to speak, I'll, I'll be addressing uh, some issues related to analogs. So I'd like to talk first a little bit about the value of analogs and then uh, touch on analog fidelity as well. Um, so analogs, in terms of their value, uh, we typically use them for two purposes. Uh, for training, which exposes astronauts um, and others, as Mike just said, you know, it would be great to train like flight controllers and flight surgeons in analogs as well. So it exposes astronauts and others to situations or stressors that prepare them then for spaceflight. Um, from the research perspective, what we look to do is create a situation or take advantage of a situation that produces effects on the human body uh, that are similar to those that would be experienced in spaceflight. So these could be either physiological or uh, cognitive and behavioral as well. Now, analogs become an ideal environment then for things like operational training for development of ops tools, this is hardware, software, any kinds of tools that could be useful uh, during ops. Um, also, to examine physiological mechanisms, you know, the how and the why the body changes the way it does as we adapt to sp the spaceflight environment. And also, countermeasure development. So, some of the types of analogs that um, NASA and other space agencies use uh, to study long duration spaceflight. And I'm going to mention uh, bed rest and also dry immersion because I don't know that anyone else on the panel would is ready to do that or wants to do that. But um, I spent a lot of time um, managing the bed rest uh, facility when NASA had one uh, down in Galveston. And I also um, worked across with our colleagues at DLR to help stand up studies at NVHAB. Uh, but bed rest is very useful for looking at changes, physiologic changes in muscle, bone, and the cardiovascular systems. So it doesn't... Um, create like a space flight environment per se. What it does is if you put somebody in bed long enough and if you tip them at about six degrees head down tilt, you can accelerate some of the processes in terms of fluid shifts, um, muscle loss, bone loss, and then you can study mechanism. Uh, so it becomes a valuable tool for looking at physiologically how do we examine then the changes that occur in flight uh, down here on the ground. So currently, just to let you know what's currently going on, um, NASA is collaborating with uh, DLR and ESA out at NVHAB uh, to look at artificial gravity bed rest studies. So um, they just put the second round of subjects in for that study uh, in September. So it's currently ongoing uh, as we sit here. Um, the other analog that helps to uh, impose, if you will, physiologic changes to the human body is dry immersion. And dry immersion um, will produce changes in muscle and bone and cardiovascular systems, but it has the added effects um, on the sensory motor system of decreased muscle tone, 
uh -huh. and also decreased afferent input. So if you're not familiar with dry immersion, you put a person into a tank and they're surrounded, you submerse them and they're surrounded by a bladder uh, full of thermoneutral water. Um, and they spend sometimes a couple of weeks like that and uh, we can then study changes. The neat thing about dry immersion is that um, it can produce some of those changes more quickly than you would see in a bed rest analog. And our Russian colleagues are very well uh, versed and skilled at uh, doing dry immersion studies and in fact collaborated um, with uh, folks at the Medez facility in Toulouse, France to actually set up a tank there as well. Um, from the behavioral and cognitive standpoint, these are your isolation analogs. And the iso isolation analogs, kind of in my mind, I like to divide them into sort of two flavors. One is the isolated, confined, and extreme environment. And these are things like the various Antarctic stations, um, the Aquarius undersea habitat where we do the NEMO uh, training missions. And for these environments, from a research perspective, research is really an add-on to the mission that is taking place at the analog. So in Antarctica, for example, they're out, maybe the ANSMET group is collecting meteorites. And well, okay, that's really more of a, say, a geological type of study, and they're doing their field research, but we can tack on to that behavioral studies to look at how does the team interact while they're out there on the ice um, and get some good information. Um, just to, to help to tell us about how do teams interact, how do they form, how do they work together over periods of time. Um, the NEMO missions, I think, are unique uh, because NEMO missions are NASA's extreme environment mission operations, and they're training missions for the astronauts. So when we tack on the research to those missions, not only do you have kind of a self-contained mission to study, they're for real astronauts. So you get data on you know, real astronauts. It's the population you really want to generalize to. Um, the other type of isolation analog is the isolated, confined, controlled environment. And here with these analogs, um, so for example, the NASA HERA facility um, is a good example of this, as well as the Russian NEK facility. And this is that facility you may recall where they did Mars 500 and more recently are doing um, their serious missions in collaboration with um, uh, NASA as well as other international partners. Now the isolated, confined, controlled environments um, is where research really becomes the purpose of the mission. So you put together a simulated mission and that by itself is a real art because you know when you put people in that analog that they know that, yeah, this is not a, I'm not flying to Mars, I'm not, you know, on a, what we did with Hera when we first stood it up, it's when we were still doing, or thinking about asteroid missions, you know, so we sent them to an asteroid. Well, they know they're not going to an asteroid. So it's a challenge to create what becomes meaningful mission activities to immerse and engage the crew so that they really feel like they're doing something worthwhile and um, something that's very valuable to uh, space flight. So that by itself, I think, is a real challenge. And then selecting the right people that feel motivated to um, complete those tasks and really immerse themselves, allow themselves to be immer immersed. So having done that, then, you select studies uh, that you can run in those analog uh, missions. Um, and they're typically studies from the behavioral health perspective that are gonna study things like team cohesion, uh, maybe sleep, changes in sleep, because you can now control this environment and insert things like sleep deprivation. You can put calm delays into this environment. You can build things into the platform that actually help you do your studies. The other beauty of the isolated, uh, confined and controlled environment is that, uh, yes, you can control it. So when you do that, you can set up multiple missions and increase your sample size. So like with HERA missions, four people go in. Well, okay, N of four, eh, it's kind of small. Well, if you do four of those missions, you have an N of 16, and now you've got a, a more robust data set. Um, so I was thinking about the comment that Bonnie Dunbar made yesterday 
um, about, and she said it jokingly, about these zero gravity rooms that existed, people thought existed at NASA, and, and don't you just put people in there to train for space flight, and wouldn't that be great? Well, yeah, it would be great. But if you think about analog fidelity, if we had that room at JSC, well, if you couldn't take that switch and dial it up to 1.6G, 3.8G, it wouldn't do us a whole lot of good because, you know, while, yes, we care about, or as Peter Gorse said, weightlessness, um, we care about weightlessness and we care about what happens, but uh, we're going to the moon, we're going to Mars. We also want to know what happens at 1.6G, at 3.8G. So unless you could dial that room to pick whatever, you know, gravitational response you wanted, um, it's not a high fidelity analog. Not to mention it wouldn't have the radiation exposure and perhaps some other things. We could that, do that. We, we could do that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we had that room. Uh, so, you know, if you think about fidelity of analogs, what do we really mean by that? And, you know, you'll, you, you may hear people, you know, scientifically argue what are the best analogs or if you can't do your study in, on the ISS, it's not worth doing. And, well, Think about it, you know, a, a, an analog is selected and chosen based upon its characteristics and what it can afford, what it can allow us to do. So yeah, I, you probably don't want to do a study on team cohesion at a bed rest facility, that just wouldn't make sense. But you would do a study on team cohesion, say, in a hair mission or an NEK mission or in Antarctica. Um, so it's based upon what, what, is, what are your questions? What do you want to study? Or in terms of training, what are you looking to train? Um, so that's how you select an analog. Um, and just to kind of give an example, there was a decision made, and this was by Tom Williams' predecessor in what used to be the BHP element. Um, the element scientist realized that the ISS was just too comfortable. You know, there was um, all kinds of communication with the ground, and we heard Serena talk about how she could pick up the phone and phone home. Um, we send up care packages on resupply missions. So, um, in terms of, you know, ISS environment compared to what's coming up in exploration, ISS is kind of a nice place to be. Um, so you couldn't study from a behavioral perspective what happens when people are really truly isolated, have no communication with the ground, or what happens when we're in a situation where there's a calm delay. So I was really happy to hear uh, Julie Robinson yesterday talk about how this is changing. We're actually going to use ISS as an analog for uh, exploration missions. Um, and she described things like extending mission duration by having these systematic one-year missions. Um, she talked about testing uh, communication delays over a two-week period, and also testing crew autonomy for conducting uh, some medical procedures. And then she also explained how um, they're standing up what will become kind of a field test too, or after being in space, coming back to Earth and doing, um, you know, ground-based sort of planetary uh, activities. So it it's good to see that uh, we're tapping into ISS as an analog because I think it's an excellent uh, place to start looking at exploration research. Um, and in closing, I'm going to leave you with one last thought. As we go toward um, exploration missions, and we all realize that there'll be less frequent missions carrying you know, fewer astronauts. If you think about like in a year's period, how many astronauts go up and down on the ISS, um, there'll be fewer astronauts to study. So in my mind, the value of analogs increases even more because now this is the place where you can do your studies and you can do them more quickly, more inexpensively, and also um, on a larger number of people. So to kind of keep that in mind, and probably preach into the choir because you folks stayed for the analog panel. Uh, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of folks that, that didn't stay, or maybe they're out in the other room, but um, you know, to think about is as we move ahead, analogs are probably going to be the place where you want to do your research. So, thank you. All right. Thanks, Dr. Cromwell. Great overview. Dr. Fomina, again. <laughs> So after Ronnie's lecture, I don't think I can add anything, but I'll try. <clears throat> Indeed, we do have experience at the IBMP to perform wonderful isolation experiments. So the 520-day isolation experiment simulated mission to Mars, and the cooperation was great. 
We cooperated with ESA scientists, and I specifically took part in two experiments with our German counterparts. One was uh, about physical impact, physical exercise impact to cognitive functions, and the second experiment was about um, selecting new countermeasures. We evaluated a vibro isolation platform, and do you know that now astronauts and cosmonauts do not have that many countermeasures uh, devices on board the station. So that's what they tell us, uh, because we eat the same food all the time, we have to use the same uh, training devices all the time. So I think that if we expand and broaden the range and the availability, it would uh, greatly impact the crew uh, and uh, will not make missions so monotonous. So I've evaluated a lot of preferences that were expressed by, the, by crews, and they absolutely love, uh, they love the passive treadmill, that means that uh, they did not have any motor to move the belt. They actually have to use their own legs to move the belt, and they loved that because it was something challenging. The most important thing I would like to say is that the analogs let us learn how scientists can cooperate together, and how they can interact with each other. We've discussed it many times as diff at different summits that our experiments sometimes copy each other or they duplicate each other, but we do study similar systems and similar people. And that's why on analog experiments we can learn about more efficient interaction between scientists. A serious experiment that is going on right now uh, is a great example. We actually, we actually uh, do uh, use a lot of international cooperation and interaction. Also, I'd like to say, Ronnie talked about the comm delays, and she talked about the experiment that took place about that. So when we did the comm delay in uh, Mars 500, we thought that crew would take it as a stress factor, but they actually felt pretty comfortable. So when we uh, restored communications, they did not want to talk to the ground. They loved it when the mission control did not give them any directions. They loved their autonomous mode of performing operations. So analogs are not perfect, of course. They know, the participants know that they can quit any time. They don't have any danger. They are safe. So it's not the real space flight. Because in real space mission, you probably do need communicating with mission control. Well, thank you very much. I would love to entertain your questions okay, if you have you. any. And I also want to thank Dr. Fomina because she was recruited rather late <laughs> for this panel. I, I will point out that the, the Russians have a facility where crew members can go into a, a very high fidelity space station mock-up module, uh, and that module in turn is, a, is in a large vacuum chamber. Uh, so when you are working a leak scenario, there is no kidding hard physiologic vac uh, vacuum on the outside of that, that shell. <laughs> Uh, so that maybe another discussion point is what what is the element of, of real risk, uh, real danger in, in forming those behaviors? Uh, there there is some merit to that. But Dr. Lowry, good afternoon. So my name is Cheryl Lowry. I am the program director for the Aerospace Medicine Residency Program at UTMB in Galveston. I'm also down there as the deputy medical director for polar medical operations. So we do all the screening for the Antarctic population that goes down for the U.S. programs every year. Uh, I'll talk to you about analogs for, for three different reasons. For the training of flight surgeons, as Dr. Barrett mentioned, uh, as well as other medical personnel, for testing of technology, and then lastly, population health studies. So uh, analogs are great. Uh, I'll use Antarctica because that's the one I'm most familiar with. I've been there twice, courtesy of the US military, and I'm going again this year for National Science Foundation. 
So, uh, but I think you could generalize my comments to pretty much any analog uh, environment. So first, we've got four of our residents here in the room today. We're fortunate for the opportunity for them to come. Um, but they each get an opportunity to go and serve in Antarctica as a, a flight surgeon or a, a medical specialist for three to five weeks, depending on the year. And this is a great opportunity for them to get trained in how to think on their feet, how to operate without advanced diagnostics, how to uh, take their own x-rays, do their own dental exams. We teach them even how to take dental x-rays. Um, pull teeth or splint teeth uh, in an austere environment. So it's just great for them to get the experience of working outside the confines of a hospital. I'm comfortable there, but it's not for everyone. So we really want to give them a good exposure to that analog population. Uh, and then the other thing is it gives us an opportunity to assess them. As I said, not everybody's cut out to work in that environment. I love to be out in the field with no advanced diagnostics and you know, no CT scanner, no MRI. It's a challenge, it's a puzzle, it's great. You actually get to hear your patient, do a physical exam, touch the patient. It's a lost art, so we bring that back through this analog and that's something I think we're gonna need to continue as we move into um, you know, longer duration space missions. Um, but it also gives us a chance to assess them in their residency training. Are they cut out for this environment? And if, if they're not, it's okay, it's not a failure. It just means that we might not use them in a deployed setting or an operational environment. Maybe their space is best left to a lab or a clinical setting. That's okay, but it gives them a low risk opportunity to test themselves, test their merit in that, in that environment, uh, and it's good training for them. Um, second opportunity is the testing of technology. So analogs are a great platform to test wearable technologies and implantable technologies. I don't know about you, but every time I touch a piece of tech, in the store, it works differently as soon as I put it on my body, as soon as I get it home, as soon as I take it outside. I can't read the screen, I can't uh, let the battery last long enough. It's not rugged, I'm really hard on my things, so I break everything. Um, but testing those things and actually wear testing them in an austere environment I think is critical. And we can't test everything on the ISS, it's not feasible. Um, so the place to wear test this technology and ruggedize it and test the battery life and test the bandwidth, operationally test it, what better place to do than an analog here on Earth and then perfect it for, uh, for use maybe in longer duration space missions. And then finally, I think analog populations are a great place to study a generic population. So we have great data on the astronaut population. We know how they do longitudinally. Uh, we know the diseases that they have. We know how their diseases perform. Um, and, and how they get worse over time, and we know that they're healthier than the general population. But we don't have this data on a somewhat screened population in longitudinal studies. So some of our residents are actually working on this, looking at what, what are some common things, even though you have a screened population, what are some common things that we find in that population that they need to be treated for, aeromedically evacuated for? Medibacs are, are difficult, dangerous, and expensive off Antarctica and some of the other analogs, like. Um, you know, the Aquarius situation. So we really want to prevent those things and mitigate risk at all, at all costs, right? Um, we don't want someone to have to have a medevac and, you know, get transported off of Antarctica in the middle of winter. Dangerous to the crew, dangerous to the medical staff, and dangerous for the person. So how do you identify those risks and maybe apply more appropriate screening tools so that those risks are mitigated? And how do you treat people in that austere environment where you don't have those advanced diagnostics and you don't have a, a massive blood transfusion capability for trauma? Um, so I think looking at them, you know, we've got great, great data. Unfortunately, they're all in hard copy records, but it's, it's rich for mining. Looking at diabetes and hypertension and cardiac disease, uh, kidney stones, or, or the fact that people don't disclose everything about their medical history when they go on these missions because they want to go, they want to be included. They forget that they had kidney stones two years ago. Or they forget about their seizure disorder and their, their medications that they're on. So how do you get people to disclose things accurately uh, is another factor. And um, just the overall health risk of these, putting people that are not astronaut physiology into this austere environment, how do they do? And then how do we keep them healthy in that environment? So things for you to consider. And we would love to have bed rest studies back. I'm just saying. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Thanks, you. Thanks, Dr. Laurie. Great comments. Dr. Pettit. <clears throat> I had the good fortune to go on an ANZMAT expedition to Antarctica. And so did Serena, different years. and. ANZMET is a search for meteorites. There's this strange 
ability for Antarctica to concentrate meteorites and then six to eight weeks of searching on the ice, you could find 850 to 1,000 meteorites. And, and there's a National Science Foundation expedition coupled with NASA uh, financing to go to Antarctica every summer to collect as many meteorites as, as we could find. So that's ANSMAT. And you gotta go where the meteorites are, which is typically way out uh, uh, on remote glacier surfaces. So uh, we found ourselves dumped out by a, a de Havilland twin otter 200 miles from the South Pole, setting up Scott tents, which incidentally, they're the same design that Robert Scott used in his 1911 expeditions, which he froze to death in one. Uh, <laughs> but it's a great design, it really is. Uh, I, for, for living in Antarctica, I wouldn't want to live in any other kind of tent. Uh, you, you are isolated and you have to rely on your own skills. And you have to be able to spend time in the tent. And you, you share a tent with one other person. It's eight by eight feet. That's the floor space. It's nine feet high. And the most time we spent in a tent was five days in a row because of severe weather. So it's small spaces, severe weather on the outside. When you are outside your tent, it doesn't look like anything back home. And the weather is cold. Uh, there are other cold places in the United States that for short periods of time could be this cold, but it, it does get cold in your tent. And you work similar to what we have on station. For station, we're scheduled for six and a half hours a day for work. That doesn't sound, wow, that's an easy thing. But we work for 12 to 13 hours a day to make sure that we can be available for the six and a half hours of station work. Well, in Antarctica, we would be out on the ice searching for meteorites for about six hours a day, but we would be up and active and working, taking care of camp, repairing snowmobiles, doing things like that for about 12 to 13 hours a day. So, so that I found was interesting that this analog in terms of crew time available for doing the mission work versus how long does it actually take you to get the work done, it's about the same. And one of the biggest eye openers for me was how effective the analog and, and uh, long duration training is uh, at NASA for crew members because you will have eight planetary geologists get together and they're just sort of randomly thrown together, you will meet them for the first time in Christ Church about a day before you fly to Antarctica. You'll spend a couple of days preparing and then the next day you know you're out on the ice with these people that you've never really seen or worked with before. And when you look at some of these people's behavior, it is jaw dropping. Uh, they, they will be out in a place where it might be five days before you could get an airplane in to fly out. And they'll be doing cookies with the snowmobiles. They'll be seeing how steep a hills they can climb. They will be doing all of this wild and wanted behavior. We had four different snowmobile accidents where people rolled a snowmobile. And, and imagine if, if you got caught under a snowmobile and broke a femur, and it was five days before you could get out. Uh, I'm, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, but, but, these, but these people didn't have, these really smart people, they didn't have the long duration training and they were doing silly things like that as if they were, were in a, a motocross track outside of Houston. And, and that was the eye opener for me is, is how, how careful, how conservative uh, crew members get when you're really in an isolated environment like that and how effective our training is when you compare it to uh, dogs and cats of really smart people just randomly thrown together and you, you see the value of not only the analog training but all, all the other 
uh, training that we go through to get us ready for flight. Thanks, Don. It's hard to follow, right. follow uh, Don Pettit. Uh, I will add to Dr. Dunbar what she said, see it and, and read about it. I say do it uh, if you want to get excited about space and be part of space. Um, and my point today real quickly is that uh, the effect of analogs is, for me personally, in 2010, I was completely connected real time as a ground team member to an EVA that was being that was done in 2010 that really saved the, the future of the space station. Um, for me, uh, th I'm Joe Schmidt. I've been a NASA flight surgeon for 18 years. I do shuttle station uh, T-38, the Vomit Comet. I'm the lead medical operations for Orion. Uh, I'm really proud of taking care of some of the uh, uh, current astronauts and some of the ones that are retired. Gene Cernan, Joe Engel, Tom Stafford. In my Air Force side, I'm a reserve mobilization assistant to the Surgeon General. And um, just prior to that, I was a deputy joint staff surgeon and occasionally got to talk to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff directly. Um, but na nothing is compared to my experiences here at NASA. Uh, one of the ones I'd like to tell you about was an unexpected pr uh, opportunity I had. I was the, na the, na the first NASA flight surgeon to be on a NEMO mission, and unfortunately the last one so far. We need to get more doing that. Um, Mark Reagan, Bill Todd, J.D. Polk, and Mike Duncan all took a chance on me and put me down there. Um, it required 25 dives to do NEMO, and I had zero scuba dives before doing NEMO, so my, ex uh, my learning curve was exponential. And that 25th dive uh, was, ne was a saturation mission for 12 days. And I'll read to you what an aquanaut is. It's any person who remains underwater, breathing at the ambient pressure for long enough for the concentration of the inert components of the breathing gas dissolved in the body tissues to reach equilibrium in a state known as saturation. And that's what we did at NEMO. I uh, really feel lucky because more people have climbed Mount Everest, I understand, that have become uh, qualified as aquanauts. Uh, there was true danger down there. We're talking about analog environments being dangerous or not. Uh, the, it was very dangerous. 47 feet uh, was our storage depth. The surface is not an option. You cannot quit for the 12 days that you're there. If you surface without going through the recompression, you will die. You'll have a stroke, maybe even an MI. Um, so much that we actually had to have a casualty officer assigned to us to take care of our, our uh, affairs and, and family members if we didn't do it. And the most of all, what I was really afraid of was I was risking the reputation of flight surgeons because I was the first one down there. <laughs> I wanted to make one. sure that I did well. Uh, often Nemo is seen as the first shuttle mission for a crew member and their hurdle to get to ISS. Um, for me, being on Nemo was 12 days of absolute exhilarating fun. Uh, I haven't experienced anything like that since, um, come close on a few things. It was absolute teamwork. Um, one of the experiences I want to share with you, or just feeling of, you really, we went on, sometimes we'd have a dive with four, four uh, aquanauts, and I knew, uh, part of that team, that I had a sense where those three other people were. Just like your dive partner, you want to make sure you know what they're doing. Uh, I, but I knew their positions. I knew what they were doing. I knew what their new actions, next actions were. Um, just really feeling part of that team was unbelievable, especially knowing that death was right above you if you did something wrong, if you didn't have your, uh, your, um, uh, your BCD uh, correct and you just surfaced by a problem. Uh, also, um, the contrast of life above and life outside of Nemo was really incredible. And I got a sense of what it was to be on station. When you had a public affairs interviews, you know, you'd hear um, before talking to interested audiences about Nemo, you'd have the, the radio announcer coming on, and sometimes you'd, you'd hear the announcements before that, and they were talking about truck sales or wireless phone commercials or, or things like that. And, and meanwhile, you're looking out and seeing all this life that's under the ocean there and, and feeling what it was to be part of a, you know, a team of aquanauts. The contrast is unbelievable. Um, the sea life was incredible. It had a viewport at the end of, and I know some of these folks in this room have also done Nemo. If you remember screen savers on your computer, there was a viewport at the end of the, uh, of the uh, sleeping area, and all night there, was, there were beautiful fish going back and forth. I literally had to turn away so I could not look at this so I could get some sleep overnight. Uh, it was unbelievable, so much that you know, we would name different critters that were outside, fish. We had a huge grouper that was there that we named Mr. Eclipse because he came in one evening. He made this big, loud uh, compression sound. You could actually feel it or hear it in the, uh, in the uh, Aquarius habitat. People were like, what was that? He went through the, the light itself and blocked the light out. The fish all left because here's Mr. Grouper, Mr. Eclipse literally kind of showing up and, and and announcing himself. Um, it was, it, oh, yeah. <laughs> There's so many things that we can't say because we're on the, the uh, uh, yeah, there are other, like was said already before, um, you know, there's so many experiments you can do down there. We did T cell activation, cortisol level. We did underwater construction, remotely guided surgery, robotics, 
really a lot of fun. We lose some of the stuff that the SEAL team used with underwater navigation. Um, you really felt the pressure of the timeline and the difficulty of all the, uh, the procedures. Um, but really what hit home with me was in 2010, um, I was actually in a, a mission control working as one of the uh, uh, ISS flight controllers. And uh, Doug Wheelock and Tracy Caldwell Dyson were out um, changing one of the ammonia pump modules. They were shower being showered with ammonia. They had difficulty getting the connectors gone there. Um, the O2 was running low. CO2 was running high in, this, in the suits. They had tethers that were entangled. They were having difficulty closing the hatch itself. And right there, we're talking about radiation earlier. The, the sun had a coronal mass ejection during that, at the end of that as well. And uh, because I felt like I was part of that team on that NEMO mission, I really felt part of it, you know, with Tracy Caldwell and, and Doug Wheelock. And I was feeling part like, what, they gonna, what are they going to do next? What are the procedures we need to do to, to get them back inside, to get the, the ammonia off, things like that. Um, you also get a sense of the absolute trust with your trainers. Uh, we were constantly being watched by the uh, crew, other crew members in the watch desk. It was a lot of fun, but very uncomfortable for about 12 days, you know, having these they had a little shower that was inside there, but you had to go to the bathroom outside in, in, the, uh, in the sea. It was a un really unusual experience. Uh, you couldn't surface, of course, and un you're under con continuous control and, and observation. One of the other things that I experienced was um, the power of the, pri the private family conferences. You know, we do that regularly with the crew members on board. They get time with their family members. I was having the 12 days of just, as I mentioned, extreme fun, um, exhilarating fun, and then have a chance actually to talk to my wife and, and some friends was unbelievably powerful. You know, we did it via, what, you know, it's called Skype now. Um, just to give a tour of the habitat, to talk about normal things with the family members, to share an experience. I really now truly understand how important it is for us to take good care of the family as well as to make sure that folks are, um, are connected. Uh, and I will just end, when I, I still do uh, ISS missions and still sit in the back in the, in the Mission Control Center, we really have the catbird seat when it comes to looking out over all the other um, console operators. And you, know, you really feel connected now to whoever's on board, watching the other folks that are in the, in the control center, what things are gonna, they're doing that potentially could affect the crew that are on board because you feel one of the, as you're one of those crew members, you feel like you're one of the divers, you feel like you're on another mission as well. So again, I cannot uh, uh, stress enough how important it is for uh, people to continue these analog missions. I often think of, you know, we only fly three or four astronauts each year from JSC. What about the 5,000 other people that, that could experience this? I know. Uh, Mike, Dr. Barrick was talking about making sure we get flight directors and other people to, and, and scientists and other people to experience this, this as well. So uh, I'll stop there and hopefully have some time for some questions. Okay, appreciate it. Sounds like that'll be a requirement for flight surgeons. Amen. To do. Right. Yes, absolutely. Captain Shepard. Shep. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think I'm the last presenter on the last panel, so I'll try and keep it brief. <laughs> um, as a crew for Expedition One, uh, we didn't get specific analog training, uh, I have a feeling that analog, the analog environment right now is more for people getting ready for a crew assignment than to bond a crew or to do something with a dedicated crew. But maybe that's one thing that you could consider shifting because uh, although we had a great interpersonal relationships and I think our, our experience in flight, I. I, I got to say, I don't think I've seen a better crew fly since ours. I'm kind of <laughs> kind of biased about that. But um, so w one element in that was we had a lot of time to work on it, uh, but I would still like to have had more opportunity and maybe in some analog environment to really socialize more strongly with uh, Yuri and Sergey. And uh, we had uh, a place in our cottage where you could get adult refreshments and that was part of it. But things like, I mean, each of the people that I knew uh, in Russia and certainly here in the US, uh, the astronaut office and some of the people around the, the support mechanism have unique skills. And I would have liked to have had an experience where Sergey, who's an excellent photographer, would teach us, the crew, something about how to do photography and maybe Yuri could teach us something that he was good at and I would teach Yuri and Sergey uh, something I felt I was good at and it would be a, a chance to uh, create that communication path because you're going to use that up in orbit 
And so when you can't do something, you've got to be able to go to your crewmates and say, hey, you know something about this, and you've already established you know, how you're going to interact. I think that's a real important thing, and an analog could draw that out. Um, some things about our flight that could easily be part of an analog environment I think are, are really important. We had uh, several issues where things weren't going quite the way that we wanted to, and we said, hey, um, where's, our, where's our galley table in the service module? And the ground said, well, yeah, it's still here on the ground. We forgot to launch it. Not to worry, it's going to come up. And we said, when? And they said, it's going to be there six months after you guys leave. <laughs> and so we said, oh, OK. And we very quietly took apart uh, the brackets for oxygen canisters and some other bolts and pieces. We made our own table. And uh, much to the consternation of the people on the ground, but finally they, they were OK with it. Uh, but there were other things like that that happened, and we really enjoyed the opportunity in our flight to be able to build something and, you know, step back from and say, hey, we did that. And I think that is, it should be a very important part of an analog. You've got to have something productive that's a challenge that gives the people in the analog a real sense of accomplishment. And, and the more of that, the better. Um, let me close on, and well, the other thing also, I always was interested in some of the cosmonauts who came to the States, and uh, I think it was Yuri Usachev who took pottery classes at uh, Ukluk or something. And there has to be a creative environment in space. It's not all work and looking out the window. You have to have something that draws out a recreational aspect that people enjoy doing other than work all day. And for us, we were hands-on guys. We liked building stuff in secret that nobody knew about, but <laughs> there are other avenues for this. So what I'm getting at is I think we need to think a little bit bigger here. ISS is itself an analog for a lot of bigger things that are going to come. Um, and certainly for how NASA and the nations that will participate, get their act together and go back to the moon, it's probably a pretty good analog for how they need to organize and you know, get that job done. Um, and the last thing is, you could even say, well, going to the moon has to be an analog because we're establishing a real spacefaring culture and we need to step back and think about you know, what we are really building here and the way humans interact with machines and you know where they go with them and what they do all right thanks very much Jeff. but just to to uh, identify the people this is sergey krikalyov and uh, yuri gudzienka uh, who joined shep they were the legendary first crew who really did establish a beachhead we had no idea how station was going to work and, and they made it work equally legendary is shep's bar the place he was referring to which probably should be added to every analog list because a lot of spaceflight learning happens there in, in the military and some of the intelligence service, they have this thing called the alcohol test. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you, get, you feed somebody enough alcohol and the real person comes out. And, you know, <laughs> not that that's medically approved, but I can assure you it works. Right. Yeah. No, someday there'll and, be a... Yeah. Uh, Mike, I think it's important to point out that Shep's bar <laughs> is in Star City, not on station. That's correct. <laughs> Good point. It's also not at NASA JSC, you know, but... Uh, we started a little late. Uh, we're, we're at our stop time, but I want to go just a little bit late to give you guys a chance to ask any questions you'd like to. There's a question in the front if we can. Jeff. Uh, yeah, first of all, I, I definitely agree with what Elena said about that in these um, isolation studies, without the risk of physical death, I sort of question any of the findings that come out. Um, but a specific question about Mars 500. My, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that when the crew actually got to Mars, they did not switch over to the Mars day and night cycle. And, and I know that um, in Harvard sleep studies, they've, they've looked into that. And, and it has significant effects on physiology and psychology. 
So uh, if it was not done, it certainly in future studies should be done. Okay. Yes, I would like to say that in Mars 500, we relied on a regular 24-hour day, and your comment is actually very valuable because it is important to do an analog of Martian day and night cycle. We used to simulate an EVA on, my, on Mars surface. So three persons stayed inside the module and three did the simulated walk. And um, besides the isolation, we tried to simulate hypokinesia, and, um, but that was it. So your comment is very interesting. We did do the sleep deprivation study because we wanted to see if it will impact their performance if they didn't sleep for a day. So, but what you propose is very interesting as well. I want to interject one comment about your first, and, thank and you. we'll go to Mr. Dave. Во-первых, если я могу. We have the discussion about how dangerous training should be frequently, and I will stick my neck out and say that the most dangerous training venue we have is caves. You're always seconds away from orthopedic trauma. When I did my caves expedition, the year before there was an injury, not in an astronaut. It took five days and 150 people to get this person out of the cave. The year after my training event, there was a fatality, and that was with a, a NASA, uh, an ESA caves uh, expedition, not a crew member. Uh, and those conversations come up a lot. Where is the balance? Where is the line? And um, so we, those are uncomfortable conversations to have. And most of us do agree that there has to be an element of danger because you will never get the right behaviors if you don't have that. But where is that line? That's, now, we still do caves. So, serious. Uh, since Salajan Sharipov asked me to say a few words, um, maybe this is my chair, I just didn't see my name tag, so I didn't sit here, but I am 73rd cosmonaut after Yuri Gagarin in, uh, in, uh, in the Soviet cosmonaut system. and. I could say a lot about the topic of this panel, but I wanted to add this. I was on Mir Station three times. I spent the total two years on Mir Station, uh, six months, six months, and a year and a half. And recently, I heard something that was new to me. When we were creating IBMP, different specialists were involved, mathematicians, physics, biologists, medical specialists. After we launched dogs in, in space, the employees of this institute came to the same conclusion. There are too many uncertainties for the scientists and to turn uncertainties into certainties, it would make sense to send a surgeon or a medical person into on the first mission, not a pilot, but a physician. Since we're talking about lunar, lunar missions, and there are a lot of uncertainties associated with that, we have one, two, three, four, five, seven people who are good candidates for the lunar mission. Almost all of them are physicians. So this is what I wanted to say on this topic. Thank you. Okay, I, I would like to close it here, but before we do, and I know there's only two of them up there, uh, just remember that the way we're communicating with one another largely is due to our interpreters. Um, I cannot tell you what difficult situations we have put them in these last couple days, and I know there's more than the two up there. So I just want to give a big shout out to our interpreter staff. Thank you. And uh, I think now we will break into the discussion groups. Yes, we're going to uh, break up into the... Uh into the groups and uh, the uh, cooperation uh, 
uh, research, uh, cooperative research group will meet right in here. Uh, the analog group will meet in room 101, which is right across from the elevator. And the education group is on the third floor.